Amish, congratulations on your opinion piece for Scientific American. You are heated. Let me read from the piece right now. Let's bring it up, uh, folks, here. Just a short snippet here. Within the next few weeks, we'll have two new antivirals. There is a real fear that if highly effective treatments stand at the ready, people will have so far shunned the vaccine, will likely never get vaccinated. How close are we to that, Dr. Adalja? Well, we know that these antivirals are making their way through the FDA. One of them is already approved in the United Kingdom, so this is imminent. And we've seen with monoclonal antibodies that people who weren't getting vaccinated were very willing to take the monoclonal antibodies. So we have this problem where we've got the unvaccinated who have shunned the science of the vaccine, but yet accept the science of the monoclonal antibodies and the antivirals. And I think that's, that's dangerous because we know that preventing an infection is always better than treating it, always. And that has to be what we continue to emphasize even though we're really excited about how these antivirals are going to be game-changing. Well, let's not dive into the weeds of David Baltimore, but let's make clear here. mRNA is what seems to be working. How is a monoclonal antibody different from Pfizer, Moderna, mRNA? Well, monoclonal antibodies are basically taking uh, an experimental animal or a synthetic type of cell and causing it to produce antibodies against the spike protein of the virus. And the spike protein of the virus is what's important for protection. So there isn't really uh, a genetic element to it in the sense that you're not getting injected with mRNA, but you're getting injected with monoclonal antibodies. But it's important to remember that for those people who don't want the mRNA vaccines, we have a perfectly great Johnson & Johnson vaccine that is not an mRNA vaccine. But many people don't take advantage of that. So I really think that this mRNA thing is kind of smoke and mirrors, and it's just general opposition to the vaccines, not the mRNA vaccines, or we would see people lining up for the J&J &J vaccine. Given where we are and given the fact that we are seeing a surge here in the United States akin to what we saw last November, we're also seeing the surge over in Europe. Do you think that lockdowns are appropriate? No, I've never been someone who thinks lockdowns are appropriate. I think that when you're going to lockdowns, that tells you that you had failure of all of your other policies. And using lockdowns now in a vaccine era, in an era when we have rapid tests so people could know their status, I don't think makes sense. And I think it's not surprising you're seeing this backlash in Europe. I think it will only get worse. Uh, what, what Europe should be doing is, at the same time as encouraging vaccines, using rapid tests to, for people to know their status so that they can go about their life if they're not vaccinated. And then uh, lots of private businesses should be trying to require vaccines as, as a condition of employment. I think that's a much better route than, than lockdowns this late into the, the pandemic. Amish, considering the fact that there is so much opposition, there have been violent protests, what do you think is the reasoning behind health officials who are backing these kinds of policies? It's unclear to me. I think that they are, are, are very nervous about their hospitals getting into crisis, and certainly for certain places in Europe, uh, certain places in Austria, Romania, Bulgaria, they are worried about hospital capacity, and, and that's likely what's driving it. Other places where we see cases but not translating into hospitalizations, I think that's probably because people don't understand that we're always going to see ebbs and flows of this virus and that it's not going anywhere. And as long as you're keeping the, the spectrum of illness on the mild side, this is a manageable problem. But right now, I think we still have mixed messaging on what the overall goals are in the United States as well as in the world with COVID-19, because a lot of people haven't come to grips with this is here to stay and our goal is to tame it. And the vaccine yeah. is the best way to do it. Well, Dr. Adalja, on that point, if this is going to become endemic, if this is something we are always going to have to live with, at what point do we start treating this virus similarly to other ones, like the flu, where, yeah, you could have the flu, you stay home from work if you're sneezing and not feeling well, but you don't quarantine for 10 days. Are we ever going to be able to treat it differently? I do think we will get there. And I wrote a piece a couple of weeks ago about off-ramps. And I think we have to start thinking about off-ramps. And we have the ability, for example, to test people to know whether or not they're contagious. And that might eventually replace self-isolation. But the biggest thing that has to happen is we've got to get hospitals not worried about their capacity. That's, to me, the biggest turning point from the acute phase of the pandemic to endemicity is when a hospital is not worried about capacity. And in the United States, many hospitals have gotten there. But there are places, including in my hometown, just north of Pittsburgh, where they have you know 30 percent of their inpatients are, are COVID-19 patients you can't have that be the case and then be able to operate a hospital normally that's the biggest issue or the biggest hurdle that we face is is getting that hospital capacity concern to dissipate well for those hospitals that are no longer concerned do you see any kind of guarantee that it won't happen again that they do have to be concerned 
I, I do think if you're in an area where there's high levels of vaccination, maybe 80% plus, and if you have a lot of prior immunity from infection in the community, you probably will do okay. Yes, you're going to see cases, but the cases aren't going to translate into hospitalizations. And what COVID has become now is more of a regional problem than a systemic problem, and that's due to vaccine and immunity in the population. <clears throat> the rest of the country is, is getting there, but there are places, for example, in West Virginia, where only 41% of people are fully vaccinated. It's going to take them some time to get to that status, but there are places like Vermont, where we see a surge in cases, but that's not translating into hospitalizations because their vaccination levels are so high and the unvaccinated tend to be lower risk. That's the goal.